good afternoon from India and welcome to this webinar series. Friends and colleagues, as you know, this is a special edition of webinar series on 10th years of HUL, Historic Urban Landscape, Opportunities, Challenges, and Way Forward. On behalf of the organizing team of UNESCO, NIUA, Metropolis, and SEPT, I, Professor Shashwat Bandopadhyay from SEPT University, welcome you to this webin second webinar focusing on the role of heritage in sustainable urban development and warm welcome. As we all are aware, cities have emerged as one of the key players for achieving a sustainable development goal by 2030 through development of sustainable policies, initiatives, and more resilient uh, well being for uh, uh, residents of urban areas. The new urban agenda and sustainable goal 11, specifically 11.4 focuses on the aspects of sustainable cities and communities, specifically on cultural heritage in urban areas. Cultural heritage is also recognized among the key catalysts to foster economic development and social cohesion in the changing global environment. In this context, the UNESCO recommendation addresses the need to better integrate the frame of urban heritage conservation strategies with the larger goals of sustainable urban development. And that's what this, that makes this entire series, the special edition, very interesting uh, to discuss some of these opportunities, challenges, and uh, way forward. We had our first webinar on 10th of November, where we have a series of presentations of experiences from the global case studies and Experts from India, practitioners from India joined in this deliberation. In this webinar too, today, we have a series of interesting presentations of experiences and lessons from Indian cities, who are, which are endowed with rich heritage assets, and they are trying to uh, create a roadmap for better integration of heritage assets to the overall urban development. And today's this fourth presentation will be followed by another round of exciting panel discussion where we have experts from various global regions participating, joining this deliberation. So we are quite excited to this discussion today. I once again welcome you all to webinar number two today, focusing on role of heritage in sustainable urban development. As we begin, we have four very exciting presentations from Indian cities beginning with Ajmer Pushkar by Dr. Sikha Jain, followed by the Kochi Heritage presentation by Dr. Rajan Chedambar, who is the Director of Center for Heritage and Development, Kochi Municipal Corporation. Then we have uh, a very, another very interesting presentation from Gwalior uh, by the CEO of Gwalior Smart City and Nishan Kupadhar jointly making a presentation. And last but not least, we have uh, Ms. Sahina Khan presenting the important initiatives of heritage management in Agra. So these are the first four presentations followed by we'll move to the discussion with our panelists. Some quick housekeeping rules because uh, there are four presentations. I request all our presenters to kindly please stick to the time of about 14 minutes per presentation. Uh, at the end of 11th or 12th minute, I'll send you a direct chat message just to give you a reminder to close it down so that we get enough time to have a kind of a very interesting discussion. So I now invite Dr. Sikha Jain to uh, make her presentation on Ajmer Pushkar. If, if Sikha is on board, can uh, anyone please let me know about it? Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Saswat Bandopadhyay, and uh, thanks to NIUA and UNESCO for asking me to give this presentation on Ajmer. Uh, I am a little tied up with my, uh, you know, share screen issue, so I would request uh, Mayura to share the presentation, and I can just quickly go over that. So thank you. So my 
presentation is about Ajmer and I'm going to talk about three aspects of it, about the Hirde project and other uh, government schemes like Smart City, how it extends, uh, how we try to integrate these projects with research components. And the, lastly, what is the impact of this project, you know, in long term at, in heritage attributes and their enhancement? Yeah, so this is, you know, we are all aware about Hirde scheme as well as the Smart City scheme which uh, in, uh, both were initiated in 2015, but of course Hirde was very focused and was really the catalyst for 12 cities and had some benchmark examples in all these cities. So my presentation is about Ajmer, which is which has both uh, linked with both the programs, the Hirde program, as well as now it is continuing some activities under Smart City. So what was focused under Hirde, we moved on to the Smart Cities and again, culture and identity was a component to address a lot of uh, historical historic course under smart city uh, next so i will focus now on ajmer and what were the works done under hirde in ajmer so ajmer is a city uh, historically since century it has uh, uh, it, it uh, has historic layers including the mughal period and later british period uh, uh, years and of course uh, it had the twin city of uh, Pushkar. So Ajmer Pushkar with the Brahma temple uh, and the um, Darga Sharif in Ajmer are really like two uh, pilgrim centers and the city has an, uh, an increasing pilgrim uh, tourism in both the cities. Uh, next please. So as part of the plan we were supposed to look at all heritage assets and mapping was done for all these tangible and intangible heritage assets including uh, uh, you know what was under ASI under the state protected as well as intangible assets looking at rituals and uh, 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 other aspects uh, even linking to cuisine and all. So we looked at of tangible intangible heritage assets in totality including natural resources etc and finally with their plan uh, which of course is downloadable from the uh, ministry website also but it, it it covers all the heritage assets in detail and then it calls out five major uh, you know, project areas or areas of influence which uh, which were taken up under Hirde to enhance the heritage attributes and to uh, take up projects which could actually show some difference uh, um, in area in the overall quality and what uh, Hirde actually uh, stands for, like rejuvenating the soul of the city. Next, please. So these are the five areas, uh, Anasagar, uh, the Naya Bazaar, Anasagar Lakefront, the Darga Bazaar, uh, the Jaipur uh, Road was the and uh, the Pushkar uh, Brahma near Brahma Temple area. Next slide, yeah. So this uh, shows a view of the Naya Bazaar area, and there were issues like uh, uh, you know uh, underground uh, wiring that was required, road issues were there, drainage was there, solid base was there. Besides, of course, the heritage assets themselves and enhancing them with facade restoration. Uh, so it was basically the heritage infrastructure around these places, but also enhancing these uh, heritage areas and making them more visible and usable for the local public. Next. So these are the issues. I'm going to show you heritage uh, areas, like the five areas, issues in one slide, and then what was proposed in the next one. So in proposal, it was basically resolving all these challenges which were recorded after detailed surveys and taking up uh, these projects for implementation. So this is for the uh, Naya Bazaar facade uh, work, including conservation and infrastructure uh, areas. So, I mean, what you see here is the facade. I think you'll see certain views after it's done also. And along with uh, this uh, uh, work, it was actually the heritage walk that was started. So this is the Naya Bazaar heritage walk, which starts from the Ajmeri Kila, one of the most historic mobile period uh, fort um, uh, area, which was uh, created by uh, Mughal Emperor Akbar. And it goes into the inside, into various havelis and residential areas and at, uh, ends at one of uh, the significant monuments of uh, Sony Jiki Nasya, covering some ASI and some unprotected monuments. Uh, this was the second area, which was the Anasagar Lakefront. So you can see the issues there. The lakefront was completely non-usable. There was a lot of solid waste issues out there. Uh, next, please. And there were proposals 
prepared to rejuvenate this lake area and to make the lakefront useful for the public. Uh, this is a view showing what it would be, but later on you'll see how it's done uh, after finishing how it looks. Next, please. So these were two of the areas. The third area uh, included the Brahma Pushkar, uh, the Brahma Temple in Pushkar, and entire street, uh, more than three kilometers stretch, which was again similar to the Naya Bazaar in uh, Ajmer in terms of its co components. So again, facade restoration, but also has heritage infrastructure, looking at drainage, underground wiring, and other infrastructure-related activities. So the next slide is going to show the proposal. So this is the entire walk area for the Pushkar uh, uh, city, including Brahma temple and the surrounding temples. So this included temples, temple havelis, and even uh, shop, shopping, which included a lot of crafts. Um, uh, craftspersons selling their uh, stuff. Uh, so it was largely not so much around the Pushkar Lake, but it went from the Pushkar uh, Lake front to the um, inner areas and really into the inner streets, giving experience of the Havelis and the Haveli temples. And uh, it went back uh, to the Brahma temple. So you can just keep clicking on this because this shows the component for the Pushkar area and it shows some views. Can you just go on clicking? The idea here, I mean, in all these projects was this is showing the proposals the idea was you know that whatever works are taken up it's not really under one scheme they had some components linked to heritage and heritage infrastructure yeah you can stop there this was the last uh, or the fourth one which is jaipur uh, uh, road which is which has the british uh, period railway station and the surrounding areas but in all these projects uh, you can go to the next one the last project was uh, area was the darga um, around the darga in ajmer and as I mentioned, in all these projects, the idea was that here they take up certain components, but there were others which were covered with various other uh, schemes like smart cities and archaeology and others. So this was the complete shelf of projects. Next, please. Uh, there was also you know, a Hirde toolkit that was developed based on understanding of the historic layers in the city. So looking at the Rajput, uh, layer, the Mughal layer, British period, Indo Saracenic, and uh, you know, Art Deco kind of influences. So, or each style was studied, and each area was allocated a particular kind of style that it really represented or its time of development. And this was uh, incorporated in some kind of control guidelines, which the municipal corporation was advised to incorporate in long term projects. So, though it was Hirde guidelines, but the idea was that they will become part of any long term programs or projects that are carried out in the city. Next, yeah, this. So, the, these are uh, examples of the toolkit that was developed looking at particular styles, whether it is in stone or it is in um, you know, metal, depending on the particular style of that particular particular area and how it can blend with the historic character of the so it included uh, signages it included uh, dustbins benches bollards and this is a complete shelf of projects so again I mean, uh, just to show that on in the first column we have all the components that were identified to be worked on under the hirde uh, program but on the next column we have other programs that were converging, you know, like there were certain aspects which were taken up the, under the Amrut scheme, that is the sewage and the uh, underground wiring. And there were other programs which are continuing under the smart city. So the whole idea was that all the programs will converge to completely and holistically develop those particular uh, heritage zones. Next. So I'll come on to the second phase of my presentation now, which is how, you know, after starting the, the work, we also realized that more in-depth research and involvement with the community is needed. So there was a parallel initiation of a research project, which is with Cardiff University and uh, institutions here, SPA Bhopal, and it was undertaken with knowledge of NIUA and the Ministry of uh, Urban Development. And we actually looked at research and community engagement to understand how these Hirde projects can work long term. Like we, we finished the project, but long term sustainability would really be with involvement of the community. So this was the focus. And under this, uh, next, next, please. We looked at historic research and uh, engaging the community. Can you move to the next slide? 
So this is one of the workshops we had uh, in the Akbari Kila itself, where we presented all these heritage projects and we uh, discussed with various experts also, and then talked to the community through a lot of social surveys. So we were looking at each project area and engaging with the people and making them understand that what is the project about and the implementation and how we can integrate uh, their role in, in these works. Next, that is post implementation. Next slide. Uh, so this, this is finally we had a um, workshop which NIUA hosted uh, in Delhi where the recommendations from the projects were presented and all the surveys were presented in, on how a community can be uh, integrated and a social sustainability model could be devised for the healthcare projects that were already closing by that time. Uh, so this is uh, just quickly show you the slides of what the projects covered. This is available on the website. All the data that was documented in terms of the historic research, historicity of the city. Next, this is just showing how Ajmer was the archival uh, images and what it is now. It, it, this is the Anasagar view. Then we have the historic city layering. Uh, from the Mughal period to later British period, you can go on clicking because it will just show the historic layers and how the city expanded. So the red one is the Mughal period and then how it, it extend, expanded uh, beyond the lines and then beyond into the railway station area and some of the historic images that show the uh, documentation of the city, including the Darga Chishti, which you can see historically and now. So, and how these traditions continue, like the Drake tradition within uh, the Darga also. Next. So, these are just before archival images and what continues as of now, showing how the traditions are continuing. Next. But also concerns about urban pressure. Uh, like you can see in this Darga Bazaar, what was really the natural features earlier historically and how uh, it is facing these urban pressures today. So the proposals uh, linked also to resolving such pressures. And similarly, the Anasagal Front, which has the Baradari protected under ASI and was taken up as a project to extend this uh, as a lakefront on both sides of the Baradari. Next. Uh, this is a view of the Naya Bazaar historically, and we took in a detailed study and uh, Akbarila from the point where the walk starts. So we actually to, uh, did a detailed study, research study with Cardiff University, including their surveys and uh, also engaging the community in totality. Next. So you can actually zoom in and there were certain streets and haveli's which were studied in detail. Uh, so you can see the various psychology, the social surveys that are carried out. This is a sample of that, talking to each and every uh, homeowner in that street. And uh, this is an example of Dakshinwara, one of the haveli's where we are interviewing the homeowners and how we can integrate the heritage work proposed and uh, implemented under Hirde, how they can be part of it and what are their views, you know, about what else should be uh, added or because this, this is at the time of closing of the implementation of the projects. Next. Dr. Sekha, I would request so you to come uh, conclude in two minutes. Okay, so I think we can just go down and uh, start the last slide, which actually talks about impact. This is just documentation, engaging the community and finding out. And in some cases, we found old paintings in the Haveli, which they said they can actually showcase as part of the work. So now I'll just conclude with a video, which shows the impact of the project. Hi, I'm Udupi Agarwal. I'm an architect and urbanist. I was with Rona from 2015 to 17, then I was engaged uh, primarily with the Hrithya project of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Rona was appointed to carry out the activities of the mission in one of the 12 selected cities and I had the privilege to be closely associated with the entire process. The mission itself was developed uh, with the aim to bring together urban planning, economic growth and heritage conservation in the cities while preserving their character. And Rona, as the city anchor, was responsible for developing the city repair plan, the infrastructure improvement plans for the heritage areas, as well as oversee the execution of the work. Ajmer was founded in the 7th century by the Johans, but was subsequently ruled by the Pathans and Rajputs, the Marathas, the Mughals, and the British before gaining independence, leading to a rich history that includes over 150 heritage assets. Keeping this rich heritage in mind, the Ridhe plan for Ajmer and Pushkar is a sensitive amalgamation of a heritage management plan and a city development plan which addresses infrastructure needs while providing sufficient amenities for growing tourism. 
The focus lies on bringing out the unique nature of Ajmer's heritage by firstly identifying the various intangible and tangible heritage assets which were mapped, documented and appraised, assessing the infrastructure gaps in and around the assets, and then through a structured discussion with stakeholders, prioritizing the zones for improvement. This led to the proposal of the development plan and a shelf of projects. With the vision to showcase Ajmer as a place of intangible, architectural, natural, as well as religious heritage, Throna prepared and executed five DPRs for the prioritized areas. The first and most popular project was the revitalization of the lakefront, a 22-acre area along the Anasagar Lake, which was revitalized through improvement in the lake ecology, provision of public spaces and recreational facilities, as well as development of a continuous pedestrian promenade along the water. So this shows the first uh, stage where it was implemented. Park adjoining the Anasagar Lakefront. Originally called Dolat Park and later renamed Subhashudyan, the park was in a state of disrepair. It was rejuvenated, keeping its history and use in mind into a cultural public space for the citizens of Ajmer. The next project was the creation of a 1.8 kilometer long heritage walk in the Naya Bazaar. Our area, which includes a number of havelis, gateways, and other structures of importance. This entailed both heritage conservation work, like facade restoration, as well as infrastructure improvement of the area. Another similar project was carried out in Pushkar with the creation of a three kilometer long heritage walk around the lake and Brahma temple, making the area less congested and more tourist friendly. execution of these projects, one can confidently say that the city has benefited not only in the improvement of the urban environment, but also the quality of life of its citizens, while the heritage assets have been thoughtfully conserved and restored. I encourage everyone to visit Ajmer to witness this unique urban transformation for themselves. Thank you. That was just showing that it's working very well and people are actually using those public spaces and it's, it's a huge Factor that uh, some works done during the hit day are still sustaining well, which were completed in 2017. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Sita Jain. A big round of digital applause for Dr. Sita <laughs> for sharing this great experience of uh, uh, heritage infrastructure and assets in the city of Ajmer and Pushkar. Uh, Thank you very much, Sita. And we have invited some comments and suggestions from the participant as well. But uh, in the, uh, as, a, as and when we visit some, I think at the end of all food presentation, we'll take a few questions. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. So friends, uh, after uh, this very exciting presentation of experience of integrating heritage with city development plan in Ajmer and Pushkar, we now move down to Kochi. Kochi, uh, and I invite Dr. Rajin Chedambat the director of Center for Heritage, Environment and Development. And over to you, Dr. Rajan. And I would request uh, the host to share Dr. Rajan's uh, brief uh, bio sketch in the chat box. Over to you, Dr. Rajan. Yeah, Professor Chashu, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I would also like to thank NIUA and the UNESCO for inviting Kochi to be part of this very important uh, uh, discourse. And uh, I actually represent uh, an institution called Center for Heritage, Environment and Development. And uh, we are an organization set up by the Kochi Municipal Corporation to manage heritage and environment of the city. Actually, it is almost two decades back that the city had taken the initiative to set up a separate uh, uh, academic wing to kind of look after the heritage and environment of the city. And I'll uh, start by talking about uh, the mandate of CHED. Uh, on heritage and uh, sustainable urban development. And, and I will also uh, kind of talk a little about the focus areas of our work, the work of Center for Heritage, uh, Environment and Development. Uh, our strategy is actually multi-pronged and uh, we have a legal mandate on heritage and sustainable urban development as far as Kochi City is concerned. And uh, this mandate is 
been given by the government of Kerala. And then we do in, uh, involve in or intervene in the matters of heritage conservation and, uh, uh, promote, uh, and promotion interventions of heritage directly. Uh, uh, kind of municipal corporation has given us the kind of uh, free hand to do that. Uh, we also work to kind of mainstreaming heritage conservation and uh, uh, and elements in all aspects of urban development uh, intervention. Uh, Kochi is, uh, is one of the fastest developing uh, urban centers uh, in, in, in the South Asian context, and this is very much uh, uh, needed. Uh, this kind of an intervention is very much uh, needed. We also work on the convergence, uh, uh, actually the convergence with uh, the state and central uh, schemes and programs, basically how we, we go to converge uh, heritage and environment in the programs of the state government, as well as the central government uh, that we do quite effectively here in uh, Kochi. And finally, we, uh, we kind of facilitate technical assistance and uh, uh, technical assistance for the municipal corporation and for the entire uh, Kochi region. Uh, and uh, also kind of be uh, resource uh, support for heritage and urban development uh, 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 integration efforts of Kochi city and uh, the Kochi uh, agglomeration area. Uh, next slide, Piaz. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, the, uh, this is a new initiative for the protection of cultural heritage in Kochi, uh, which uh, actually the heritage of Kochi boasts of centuries of rich heritage, uh, both monuments, buildings, artifacts, uh, streets and uh, tangible, tangible, so many different things. But I would, I would say that uh, unfortunately, not all in very good uh, state. I would say it's a state of uh, uh, neglect. Uh, we, the people of Kochi, uh, are really proud of our pluralistic uh, and uh, diverse uh, culture, and uh, we even say that uh, diversity is our uh, heritage. The city corporation feels that it is, uh, it's historical, it's. it's uh, historical duty to kind of undertake to conserve and promote the rich cultural heritage and the diversity of Kochi and it, it puts in a lot of effort and actually we have 74 councillors and almost everyone knows uh, what is heritage and the importance they should give uh, uh, to heritage uh, even when they have a lot of pressure on the the development like you know in courts what is development actually so uh, here uh, we emphasize a large scale initiative to preserve and uh, promote the cultural heritage of Kochi. We had uh, support from so many institutions like UNESCO was here for a couple of years back. Now we have SEPT came in uh, supporting us and then the UA for sure and so many institutions and local uh, urban designers and architects and heritage enthusiasts, all of them come uh, to support the city. And uh, we, the, the scheme which we are uh, kind of PV and, and besides kind of involve the conservation and management of heritage sites and centers. And, uh, and we are like, you know, kind of coming up with appropriate laws and uh, policies that allow us to kind of manage our heritage and uh, kind of uh, uh, development in line with our unique identity and uh, our uh, kind of uh, vision for uh, development. And next slide, please. Yeah, so like, uh, uh, so just previous slide, I mean, actually, uh, just back to the previous slide, I guess, okay, thank you. So uh, um, here, like, uh, uh, we have kind of introduced a world-class conservation effort with the support of, like, the local uh, institutions, like, in academic institutions and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, experts uh, in, in the field. And, um, uh, um, and uh, next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, we address cultural, built, and uh, natural heritage and attempt to bring in world class conservation efforts for sure. And, uh, and now let me take you through uh, our direct intervention on heritage promotion in the city of Kochi. We have identified uh, zones. We have really worked. Actually, this all these work, uh, works have been carried out uh, without spending much of a bunch of, bunch of uh, money because the city does not have that much of money to spend on uh, heritage but we've been getting a lot of support local support of, uh, 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 kind of a csr or um, the csr as far as the expertise is concerned not just just funding uh, and uh, many people really contributed uh, towards that and now we have like you know identified uh, kind of heritage songs within the city and uh, this the Fort Kochi and uh, Fort Kochi uh, heritage song is the key to it all this because 
the most tourists both uh, domestic and foreign uh, tourists like uh, uh, come, kind of come and stay in this area we kind of do a lot to kind of preserve the heritage uh, uh, city and we the tourism department the state tourism the tourism department also kind of invest a lot uh, uh, in this regard yeah and um, the next slide please yeah so then we have uh, identified heritage zones within the kind of uh, kochi city and uh, we have a lot of structures and uh, we have a lot of these areas, uh, but then all of them are under pressure uh, uh, of uh, development in the sense like uh, even even I said like you know, all the 70 plus, 74 councillors are for heritage, but then they have a lot of pressure uh, in kind of uh, allowing them uh, along, along the local people or uh, building owners. Uh, all to kind of come up with new modern structures and also uh, there is always this conflict but then we've been kind of uh, documenting properly we've been uh, doing everything and legisl legislation is very important because only with the support of law we can kind of uh, do something and uh, yeah next yeah next slide please uh, and again like you know, we have the fort Wipeen and then we have wellington island heritage zone wellington island is a man-made uh, uh, kind of uh, a place but then we have a lot of uh, a colonial especially british era kind of buildings and structures and our uh, coaching fort offices so over there is again a heritage building but then we don't really have much of a role in the conservation or preservation or, or whatever of that uh, building or in that area because that area is controlled by the port but then now they have set up a museum over there and they have uh, they are also taking the heritage aspect very seriously because all the foreign tourists especially the ship pond tourists come to that area and now they are working a lot a lot on that and we we are supporting uh, them a lot in that yeah next please next slide please yeah and then like you know uh city like you know, we uh, we talk about uh, not just the built heritage or cultural heritage the natural heritage as well and then we have the canals uh, this lifeline of Cochin. we have got almost 48 kilometers of canals going through the city and uh, they are age old and uh, and that uh, these canals used to facilitate all the tra uh, transportation of the city now we are trying to revive them uh, in uh, over a period of time the pressure of development we had a lot of encroachment a lot of people encroached upon uh, all these canals they are not navigable now then we are kind of working to kind of regain it so old glory we are we are investing a lot on the canal network and the process Ashwat was involved in one of the uh, restoration project that is the mullasheri canal project and uh, and uh, now we are with the support of the ice and i'm coming to that i have a slide on that uh, we are kind of uh, trying to uh, regain the, the lost glory of that uh, canal uh, through a, a blue green infrastructure uh, kind of a concept yes next one is here next slide yeah, and then canal network, and I said, then, then we have Mangalavanam, uh, the natural heritage zone, then we have uh, Kochit Ustri of backwater. Actually, it's the Bampanar, like it's the second biggest Ramsar site in the country. And we are like, you know, seriously uh, working on to preserve that. And uh, all the development pressure, first of all, uh, goes first to the Bampanar Lake because a lot of encroachment happening, a lot of uh, new construction coming after encroachment. Actually, Port last couple of years back when a port encroached upon, uh, kind of, and uh, what do I say? Like uh, I, I shouldn't use the word encroached upon, but like you know, they 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 kind of uh, took over uh, part of the backwater and built a huge hotel over there. It's run by a private party now, and um, like it was like a lot of pressure on that. And we cannot say blindly no to all these development big development things because uh, that's supposed to be one of the biggest. Uh, convention centers uh, built uh, in Kerala recently but like you know, we are balancing we are trying to balance we need to kind of have development we need to have the preservation conservation of energy we got to balance taxes come in place over here and uh, that's what we've been doing we've been managing very very well yeah next one please next slide please yeah so uh, we work on the premise that heritage interventions and planning issues are uh, uh, both can both are close to each other, we are linked to each other. And we try to kind of retain and kind of integrate heritage elements in uh, mainstream planning. And uh, uh, we have also tried to regulate heritage buildings and have come out with a heritage bylaw. Actually, uh, we have a heritage bylaw passed by the council. Uh, we have notified that, but like the people have a lot of uh, apprehension about that bylaw. Like we every day we get a lot of uh, 
communication with regard a lot of the suggestions and uh, we have yet, yet to finalize that but we have a heritage bylaw and um, then environmental health sanitation issues and uh, overcrowding all these issues associated with natural and built uh, element uh, environment is very much uh, there and uh, we need to uh, we need actually detailed guidelines on certain almost not just certain almost all aspects uh, like water red development and um, and, and all the, because water development is very important to preserve our uh, canal network. So we need all that intervention and um, uh, and uh, pollution. Actually, like you know, uh, like uh, last point you would see like the lack of uh, pollution controls uh, near the national heritage area is uh, 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 is a critical aspect because a lot of wastewater uh, is getting into that is polluting and it's becoming like you know brackish water sort of a thing. So. We need to really intervene and do things uh, seriously, not only on our uh, cultural heritage, on our natural heritage as well. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, actually, like you know, we have uh, kind of developed a system to kind of uh, prioritize uh, intervention. Like, you know, where do we need, really need to kind of intervene and uh, uh, kind of uh, categorization and grading of songs based on heritage values? And that we have been working. We are uh, uh, we are preparing on on that, and we have a lot of students working on it. And uh, we will be able to complete that work very soon. Actually, a couple of years back, we had. Uh, uh, you know, score team working over here to kind of make Kochi uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, cultural landscape, you know, score uh, kind of uh, uh, cultural landscape, but then uh, that was not uh, succeeded. But then we're still working on uh, such uh, uh, such aspects and prioritizing our intervention. Where do we really have to focus and what we go to do on a priority base? And all that's uh, we've been doing with the support of all these people I've been mentioning. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, the principles we follow while designing uh, for our heritage zones. Uh, uh, basically, we ensure basic amenities, even while improving beauty and uh, aesthetic quality in all these uh, uh, places. And uh, actually, like you know, to kind of enhance, uh, to ensure health, uh, sanitation, and safety in all these things, all these areas. So, uh, preparation of uh, urban um, kind of design guidelines for heritage area. That is what we really do, and we've been uh, uh, using a lot of uh, uh, centrally assisted uh, project funding for that, for the Amrit funding and the smart cities funding, and, and all to carry out uh, that. And uh, we have a lot of, fortunately, we have a lot of international institutions working in Kochi. We uh, kind of seek the help of uh, their expert, uh, experts to do all these things. Yeah. And next slide, please. I'll just go a little faster. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have kind of, we've been working on uh, a, a, a detailed and comprehensive heritage match plan and maps. And we are also disseminating uh, these efforts to uh, uh, citizens, uh, uh, including uh, students. And we have I also identified long term, mid term, and uh, kind of uh, a mission project as far as uh, uh, natural and cultural heritage are concerned. Yes, next slide. Yeah. And uh, uh, there are some of the, um, uh, actually, these are uh, uh, the uh, kind of uh, mid term or medium term projects that we are going to kind of undertake, uh, uh, including conservation plan for heritage portraits of uh, Matanjali, the tourist area, and uh, total conservation of mangroves. They are the uh, kind of lung or lung of the city. We are, we are going to uh, do that on a kind of as our uh, mid term uh, project uh, uh, scheme. Yeah, next slide, please. And there are also the ongoing projects, and these are being taken up on a mission mode, and uh, which are nearing completion and uh, kind of uh, controlled duration. For instance, Broad Bay Urban Renewal. It's a project like uh, we carried out with the support of uh, an architecture college over here, and led by two city-based uh, kind of urban designers on Billy Manon and uh, Monilta Chatterjee. They work uh, from uh, they work us very uh, they work very closely with us. They are our panel kind of expert and. And uh, this uh, uh, Broadway project actually was part of the, uh, we prepared the DPR and uh, we have submitted 
and we try to can implement that uh, project uh, during the JNNURM phase. We got almost 20 crore rupees to implement that project, but then there was some issue. Now through smart cities, CSML, uh, we have a mission uh, called CSML, which is Smart Mission Limited. Through them, we are trying to kind of implement the, that project. And uh, then a, a Manglavan, as I said, this Manglavanam is the forest within the city. We are trying to do a conservation project that's also nearing completion. Next, next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Arthur, I'll just like to request yeah. you to continue. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll just, uh, this is the little, I'll just show the little interventions that we do, just uh, pass, uh, just you can speed up the, yes. So uh, Reimagining Kochi is a project that we do with the support of uh, uh, WR World Resource Institute. And then Kochi Water Metro is something which is going to take uh, care of the water once we have transportation. So we will uh, kind of, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, have, uh, and the preservation and uh, and this in inland waterways and the water metro is uh, as a sustainable way to preserve our heritage uh, and establish a multi-model uh, public transport system and yeah next yeah next you can go, go to the next yeah, actually like in you know, combining the preservation of heritage promotion of cultural activities with recreational activities and green uh, public spaces here you can see Palatram and cultural center which we kind of built and uh, now we kind of uh, yeah managing and a lot of cultural performances over there on every evening. That's in the tourism area. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, and we do a lot of projects like uh, kind of uh, campaigning, preservation of heritage, promotion of cultural activities with recreational activities and uh, green public spaces. That is another thing that do. And we do a lot of uh, green uh, space initiative, biodiversity initiative, like linking heritage conservation with climate change adaptation measures. And next slide, please. And uh, we kind of involve uh, involving citizens in planning efforts. Heritage place planning is an integral part of uh, the my Kochi. That was I was talking a, little, uh, a couple of minutes ago. The the Enter Kochi uh, that's called my Kochi. Uh, it was a, a plan a participatory planning program. And we kind of executed it very well with the support of GIZ. Next slide, please. Yes. And we kind of uh, uh, kind of get students like the heritage and environment clubs at schools to induce the younger generation. I think they could gather people who would take the uh, heritage uh, uh, officer will take it forward. And uh, I'll, I'll just conclude fast, like you know the next slide. And uh, there is a lot of convergence with, uh, happening with government of India and state government programs to develop heritage, tourism, economic development within the city. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, this is a, a recent example of integrating ecotourism and responsible tourism to promote cultural and heritage of Kerala. It's, it's a state government initiative. And next slide. Uh, we have been uh, very fortunate to associate with UNESCO and various institutions of eminence nationally and globally uh, to support and sustain our efforts. We And actually through these kind of forums, we look forward to technical collaboration with organizations like uh, ICOMOS and uh, uh, yeah, SEPT is already there and the UA is the uh, UNESCO is already there, but like you know, institutions like um, ICOMOS and other uh, international institutions that can come and support Kochi in all these endeavors ours. Without their support, I don't think we will be able to lead, reach to our logical conclusions. We will be always like, you know, doing, doing, but to, to conclude all these things, we need a lot of support from all of you. I think I'll conclude my uh, presentation over here. Thank you. Uh, sorry for taking a little more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. We all know Kochi being a very creative city and also very active in different areas. And thanks for sharing with us your journey your achievements and also you clearly mentioned about your need for technical handholding and guiding this journey together. Uh, wonderful and at the end of all four presentation, I will come back to you. Maybe you can have a quick chat. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, friends, we now move to the another exciting presentation from City of Gwalior. I invite Ms. Jayati Singh, CEO of Gwalior Smart City and uh, Mr. Nishant Upadhyay. And I would also request the host to share their uh, brief introduction in the chat box. And over to you, uh, Ms. Singh. Good afternoon. The members who are present in this forum, uh, I am Jayati Singh, CEO of Smart City, uh, Golia Smart City Corporation Limited. And uh, in interest of time, we will be starting right away with our presentation. Can it be put up? Nishant, can the presentation be streamed? Yes, it's on. 
Okay, okay. So we start right away. So Gwalior is a historic uh, city, uh, which is in Madhya Pradesh. It uh, is an erstwhile princely state. And as part of uh, Smart City Corporation Limited, we have undertook a lot of heritage work here. So our core premise, basis which Gwalior Smart City was actually selected, is the heritage conservation work, which, which we are currently uh, 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 executing in the city. So moving on, this was one of the first projects. It is actually a, a, a palace which is situated in the heart of city known as Maharaj Bada. It is one of the oldest example of Maratha architecture, which is present in fact uh, across uh, Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. So, so our basic premise uh, of for the philosophy that we follow here is adaptive reuse. So what uh, we undertook was that, of course, the preservation of the structures, heritage structures that we have here. So in the recent time, post-independence, a lot of these structures have uh, been uh, taken up by various offices and government uh, and, and, and are used as government premises. So first step in this direction was to get those premises, uh, to get those premises under purview of smart city or municipal corporation and then restore it as to, to bring it to its original fabric. For example, the structure that we are talking about, it is completely made of stone, local stone, Gwalior stone, which is present in Gwalior. But due to its use as a government office, we found out that whereas modern plumbings, electricity, etc., was added. Can we go back to the previous slide, Nishan? The various facilities, modern amenities were added, which were not in keeping with the fabric of the building. As a result of it, there was water logging. As a result of it, there was seepage. As a result of it, the building has started settling down. So we restored it. We brought it to its original fabric with which it was created and envisaged. Then, of course, was reconstruction. Reconstruction was a major part of it. As we see in later part of site, that significant decay has stepped in in these buildings. We reconstructed it and brought it to its original glory. Now, not only did we reconstruct it, but we also reused it, as in we brought in adaptive uses for these buildings. The whole idea of adaptive reuse was to ensure that this building has its own sustainable source of revenue, so that going forward, uh, we, it would not need intervention on a large scale, but the municipal corporation can undertake its uh, conservation and restoration and whatever minor repairs have to be done can be done because the revenue source which is already coming in. Next. So advantages of adaptive reuse, as we clearly see, the conservation work was a most challenging work because nowadays we do not have many technologies which were used in erstwhile time to conserve it. So one of the challenges and one of the, one of the in fact, achievements here is we have been able to connect with a lot of artisans who, who were or who were in the field of using these, these uh, traditional uh, techniques, traditional construction techniques, traditional plastering techniques, traditional uh, 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 techniques of uh, uh, load balances, etc. And we brought them onto the forum with us. We had very strong dialogues with them. And basis is we were able to develop a completely uh, new methodology of working on these buildings, which is suited to the fabric of these buildings. For example, all the, all the plaster that we have done, we have added uh, gourd and surki, which is something that we were using here traditionally. And uh, similarly, a lot of uh, while we were working on these buildings after dismantling, after dismantling of the outer layers or the layers which were put in, we found out that, that there were many original paintings, there were many, many original wall work which was present here. And we brought in local artisan painters from the city who, who were part, who were associated with the princely state erstwhile. We brought them and they helped us to conserve and to restore the paintings and the mirror work and the jhumas and everything to its original glory. So that has been one of the most challenging aspect of working on these buildings. Moving on, next please. So adaptive reuse is one of the most significant uh, pillars here that we have been able to convert it. For example, we have uh, uh, the building that we earlier showed, the palace building, we have been able to convert it into a museum with its own steady source of revenue. Then there were various other elements that we were able to convert into a planetarium, wherein we are showcasing two, two, two films every day. 
and we have uh, kids and uh, uh, youngsters who are coming into the planetarium and they are viewing these films. Similarly, we had a, a building which we have now developed as a digital library, a central library, which is being used by a lot of students who are preparing for competitive exams. Similarly, we had a couple of other structures which we are in the process of converting into the uh, uh, a, a hard market or a commercial hub for eateries, et cetera, that we are doing. So one of the strengths was that we have been able to visualize, imagine a reuse strategy for each of the building, which is in keeping with the structure and the nature of the building. Moving on. Uh, previously, I had discussed about the traditional and non-destructive techniques that we had to develop, that we had to start from scratch and to develop over a period of time, as a result of which we were able to develop a backward as well as, as, well as forward linkages in terms of sourcing of these materials, in terms of sourcing these uh, uh, artisans, these craftsmen, the woodwork, etc. We were able to build in a strong team and it has, and due to this, uh, in fact, there were many, many, many painting techniques. For example, there's a technique called as Chitera, which is very popular in this area. And now very few people are left who actually use this uh, painting technique. But because of our work, we have been able to bring them to forefront because we use them in these buildings and they had done extensively, extensive work and the work has been recognized across city, across state. And now we have also helped them to, to take their skill further. We have also helped them to develop their own portals or to develop miniature painting, which we are also sourcing at the souvenir shop of the museum that we had in fact earlier told you about. So, so we were working on all of these things and it was very important that we go back to basic and start afresh. Moving on, please. Moving on. Next, please. So the history is again something that we would like to speak about. So Maharaj Bada is actually heart of Gwalior, where we have seven different uh, structures, seven different heritage structures, which are all of different architecture style. Some are Maratha, some is Gothic, other is a amalgamation of a North India or a South India architecture or a temple architecture technique. So that way we had very different styles of monument, very different construction techniques to work with. And we have been able to, to, to work on these individually and to work on them holistically also and to, to conserve and preserve the whole area. So moving on. So the vision of Bolas Smart City was to, of course, do the conservation work of the, the, the uh, heritage elements that we have in our city, but also to blend technology and to use in a modern and a holistic way, which is our vision and which we have been executing in this city. Moving on. So this is some of the example of the uh, uh, situations in which we found these buildings. Uh, for example, we can see that uh, the courtyards and the seepage that has stepped in. In many places, we can see steel girders which, are, which were being used to support the building. Uh, in many places, we can see, I think, uh, electrical amenities, etc., which, which were added uh, post facto in these buildings and which were, in fact, harming the building. Moving on. Uh, again, we can see the railing sections which have which have been missing, the collapsed part of these buildings, the the modern uh, uh, amenities which had had been added. So we had to work around them. We had to to get them structurally evaluated and to develop the whole thing in in a way so that in the way that we can see presently. So it was a huge challenge to recreate everything, and we have been able to do it. Now, uh, what are the strategies? Again, we are talking in detail about it because it has been a significant learning for us as to how to take up these buildings and do it. Again, we used uh, we used extensive site, site planning. We used uh, uh, extensive interaction with the workmen, with our team of people with whom we were able to work. Again, automation, ICT solution were, were added. For example, in the museum that we are talking about, it is based on a physical as well as digital concept. So there are many visual elements which were added in, in which were showcasing the entire culture of reason. For example, we have 16 galleries in that museum, uh, which we had developed. So a gallery is a music gallery, wherein we, we, we planned it in such a way that we are able to experience music. For example, when, we, when you step into that gallery, you can actually listen to the to the drupad and and uh, rab of tansi so so there is a element wherein you can experience the whole thing not only just visually by seeing the physical artifact let us say instruments or sarod etc but you can actually go uh, put on headphones and listen to what music that we're talking about you can we can listen to let's say 
swar and the rag of uh, of of this country sare gama pa it can already be uh, is present there we have originally composed it put it there and people can go and listen it so we have added in a lot of it techniques a lot of uh, modern technology so that people are not only able to view the architecture and that we have recreated and conserved but also to experience culture of gwalior and the surrounding places of gwalior in a very interactive manner in a very digital manner and in a manner in which they are able to have a holistic experience so that has been a major significant pillar of the adaptive reuse that we are talking about again some before and after after uh, pictures wherein uh, the the entire dilapidated structure was brought to life by us moving on uh we are in again in detail talking about the various uh, processes that we had adopted uh sand blasting etc was done again a lot of uh, uh, techniques such as bringing in jute and pulses handmade tiles heritage tiles were added so as to we keep the original fabric of the building moving on uh Uh, we are talking about in detail about the digital museum so we can see that uh, there are various kiosks which have been put up there there is of course the jitera painting that we are talking about it is actually present in the third uh, uh, picture from the uh, third picture on uh, right where we can see the local paintings that have been done on these wall which are done all naturally then in the top most right we can see rag and ragini so gwalior has a very strong musical heritage as well in addition to the architectural heritage so there is chosar rag and ragini which are present here that we have showcased in museum these pictures were originally created they were part of a, of a, of a, of a, um, a palace here of a, which is part of fort complex but they had gone into uh, disrepair we we managed to get people who were able to create all these rag and raginis and we are displaying them into the museum so it is a very very unique feature and we have recreated it here so that it will survive um uh, it will survive for a longer period of time uh, then again we have worked on the entire thing and the uh, change is obviously visible self sustainability is again a pillar of the the whole smart city project wherein we try to bring in some revenue generation streams into the whole thing so that the project is able to survive again moving on next uh, other buildings that we have taken so these are some other buildings uh, that we are show can you move to the previous slide nishan just one second so these are again some of the previous uh, works that we have done so this bada complex as i was talking about has seven different buildings uh, three of the buildings are showcased here so we have a, a post office a earth file post office which we have been able to develop conserve it and bring it to the present form again we had library a uh, central library is another structure that we had worked upon and we have been able to to not only conserve the building but to find a good useful public use for the building and in a way so that the library is generating its, its revenue from the readership and we are able to give it to people so these are some of the other example of the project that we have undertaken moving on nishan please another example is the facade uh, facade improvement facade restoration facade lighting work that we have done here uh, so we can see various structures we have taken also the fort uh, that we can see on the bottom uh, left hand side is uh, again another structure that we have taken wherein the gwalior is gwalior is very famous for its fort and we have been able to light it up its facade is clearly visible this is something that is actually visible from entire part of the city so from every direction when we look upon it we are able to see this lighted fort and the lighted hillock and it it, it has led to lot of uh, positivity in the city moving on i think now nishan you would like to take over and explain the historic urban landscape work that we are doing yes thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you miss singh and i would request nisha in the interest of time if you could uh, yeah. quickly maybe couple of minutes just explain yeah, Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you might have uh, uh, noticed already, that Gwalior was a perfect place to start uh, thinking that how we can do a pilot project for historic urban landscape approach, uh, because uh, so far in South Asia itself, uh, no such project had been undertaken, uh, which was led by UNESCO field office. Uh, in this case, UNESCO New Delhi office uh, led this project. Uh, which was funded by uh, Madhya Pradesh government and well supported by the uh, municipal corporation. And um, so, to understand the process, this is the Maharaj Wada we are talking about with this uh, beautiful uh, ensemble of different type of architecture, and uh, that is what is being restored and put back into use. Uh, 
Uh, there is a what we focused on is cultural heritage built and intangible, uh, urban infrastructure, creative industries, uh, urban services, and uh, natural environment, and most importantly, quality of life. Uh, the project is a start, uh, which which was launched in June 2021 uh, by Honorable Chief Minister Mr. Shivrat Singh Chauhan and uh, Srimati Usha Thakur, the Minister of Culture of uh, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, has basically taken off in the way that uh, we first introduced the project to the stakeholders, we started collecting secondary data, then we collected primary data uh, about uh, right from the communities, right from the field itself, and uh, then we are, we are on the phase of discuss discussing with the stakeholders and the communities, the local communities, soon we'll be having some workshops around it, when, then we'll propose some recommendations, which will be the draft guidelines, uh, which can help for the development, uh, further uh, improvement and enhancement of uh, uh, Gwalior as a city and uh, then integrating it into different kind of workshop, which also includes certain interesting exchange site visits between uh, various examples in Europe and in India, and uh, ultimately leading to uh, tangible guidelines. Uh, we are at this phase where we are urban, uh, we have mapped uh, the cities, we have tried to understand the character of the city, as we have seen in previous uh, uh, projects as well. Uh, that's what we are trying to go ahead with. But interestingly, also what we are trying to assess is how we can put the city on uh, building information management system. So we are trying to integrate technology into the way how cultural heritage of a city uh, is uh, conserved and also how the city can use uh, technology to, uh, to be able to get, get a better data and also for future to be able to control and regulate the development. And uh, uh, we conducted a series of interview, which also included focus group discussions and also uh, surveys throughout the city to be able to understand what people of Gwalior would like uh, as attributes of the city uh, and also to establish the character of the city as well. And uh, so this is the public survey. These are a few of the initial results. So we are still processing it and how people aspire, the aspirations of the people and how, uh, what are they focusing on? Uh, people were very proud of their cultural heritage clearly. Uh, and uh, then there are certain areas where they would like uh, to be worked upon is uh, how to uh, uh, have better sanitation, have uh, uh, pollution, which is uh, a usual urban challenge in other cities. Uh, but apart from that, uh, the good markets and the friendly people and uh, the architecture and public places was one of the highlights which people really appreciated about the city. And um, overall, coming to the conclusion, what we are looking at is that first we would like to add the, look at the overall well-being of uh, the city uh, through this project to see that how people uh, and the citizens' quality of life can be enhanced, which is the primary goal of the whole approach. So. Uh, moving a little bit beyond uh, built heritage and intangible heritage, we are trying to address the quality of life, which in turn uh, uh, conserves and preserves the city's uh, values, the socioeconomic growth to enhance and create more innovative uh, uh, solutions to uh, have livelihood and have skill trainings, which we already has happened through the smart city mission, and uh, then guiding the urban, uh, uh, the urban regulations and uh, planning which can uh, how the growth can happen and then the innovative land use which is HUL recommendation provide uh, uh, to uh, to also look at how you can have mixed land use to be able to uh, uh, see and also in in uh, and also instilling the values and uh, the vision of smart city plan which is adaptive reuse methods and uh, just to uh, mention to you, uh, Ms. Jethi Singh is already sitting in one of the projects they have done. So this is actually Moti Mehal, which has been restored into a very sci-fi high-tech uh, smart city center. So that's the center they are actually operating from, which I think is a beautiful success story, which to be highlighted. And lastly, we would like to also address the sustainable development goals uh, through the project. The results of this project is basically that uh, we will have in the end HUL recommendation and guidelines for Gwalior. And uh, as a byproduct, we will also have a guidebook for application of HUL approach in whole of South Asia because there's a certain cultural in, uh, similarities and certain paradigms which binds us together as a subcontinent. And I think that could be very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nishant. And thank you so much, Ms. Singh. This was really wonderful. And I request all, all the participant attendees, please a big round of digital applause for 
to the team gwalior and it is so heartening to see me seeing an administrator like you and the ceo of a smart city uh, kind of spearheading this heritage initiative this is simply wonderful i'm sorry because that due to the limitation of time uh, we are unable to take uh, kind of question now but i must compliment the entire team of gwalior smart city and dharakal it's truly wonderful and and we hope for look forward to see uh, as we go forward thank you thank and you. Friends, uh, friends now we move to another uh, very interesting presentation after this some exciting uh, presentations from kochi gwalior and of course ajmer pushkar but uh, now let's move to agra and i invite my colleague uh, sahina Uh, and also apology for the to the panel is that we will be ten minutes late to start uh, the panel discussion. Uh, so I request over to you, Saina, and I request the host please uh, introduction of Saina to in the chat box. Over to you, Saina. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shashrat, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, share my experience in this webinar series, which focuses on the role of heritage in sustainable urban development. Taking the case of Agra, uh, which is uh, actually my hometown, and I have been working in the city in different capacities for more than a decade. Uh, the case of Agra is quite distinct as compared to the other cities' presentations that we've seen. Here, the highlight is actually reimagining the approach towards heritage conservation. as a means for poverty reduction in low income communities and settlements so when we look at historic uh, cities they are actually placed at a juncture where we have living heritage which coexist with the economic growth and together having a direct impact on the resources for the future so this adopting an appropriate approach to urban conservation which maintains a balance between the three can actually ensure sustainable urban development and in in fact an investment in cultural heritage can actually act as an asset which can have a collective impact on the social cultural and economic benefits to the communities which are living around it uh this is just a content outline just to set the uh, context of it so it's it would be looking at a very uh, short snapshot of the multi layered history of the city of agra i'm sure men everybody knows about the city of agra the existing status of the cultural heritage the tourism based economy and the trickle down impact of the uh, of the tourism economy on its people especially the urban poor how much do they benefit from it and what should be the approach that the city has adopted and is ab- adopting through various initiatives then diving deep into a pilot initiative which was m- focusing on a uh, on a community led heritage walk and scaling up that initiative in the city in a priority area which is taj ganj which is actually the neighborhood of uh, taj mahal and what should be the way forward so if you look at the evolution of the city uh, uh, the uh, the initial history dates back to the epic period but more tangible evidence uh, are available from pre lodi and the highlight of the city is obviously the mughal period where much of the development took place in the city going on to the british period or the colonial period and to the present day uh, city of agra so if you look at uh, the the evolution of the city it has evolved from being an imperial mughal capital to the british head quarter and now a district uh, head quarter and an important tourism uh, destination in the world does historic urban land and time and the uniqueness and identity uh, of this multi-layered history of several centuries have actually re- resulted in a plethora of cultural heritage in the city to be- begin with there are 72 protected monuments in the city which are protected by the by the archaeological survey of india and among them are the three world heritage sites everybody know, very well knows about it the taj mahal red fort and fatehpur sikri but apart from these protected heritage there's immense non protected heritage in the form of both intangible heritage and uh, tangible heritage which is in the form of the mughal urban morphology so we find the mohallas katras bazaar mandis ganj we also find the residential typologies in terms of havelis in terms of the colonial bungalows 
as well as the residential uh, gardens. And then uh, because apart from it being an imperial capital, it was also a very important uh, commercial center during the, the Mughal era. So we also find a lot of traditional skills and crafts that exist in the community, uh, in the in the city. So we have stone inlay work, we have zardozi, which is happening in the city. We do have ma marble carving, as well as carpet weaving, the peta industry, which is more uh, later on. And because of a mix of the various communities which came to the, to the city during different phases of history, it has a very rich uh, religious and cultural systems also, plus uh, the cuisine, which I should not miss on. Uh, apart from that, we have a very rich natural and hydrological heritage existing in the city. No doubt that Yamuna played a very critical role in determining the overall uh, historic uh, development since the uh, Mughal era. Uh, but there is a very intricate riverine system. There are various channels and canals. There are exhaustive number of halls and ponds which exist in the city and uh, the bells which dots the city. So it has a very rich uh, natural and hydrological heritage that exists in the city. Uh, so assuming looking at all the expense of heritage that the city has, uh, the city's economy is, I would say, dependent on heritage-based tourism. So like 55% of all the visitors that can come to the country visit Agra. These are uh, data like in the pre-COVID times. So there is a significant heritage-based tourism in the city. So one third of the share is actually, uh, one third of the sh uh, share of the overall economy, economy is based on heritage and tourism. So looking at these data with the growing numbers of domestic tourists and international tourists, one would assume that uh, heritage tourism is the main economic driver and contributing towards economic, social, and urban development of the city. However, if we look at the other side, the reality is quite a bit different. Uh, if you look at the numbers uh, at the various sites, we see that tourism in Agra is, is very monument centric with investment largely focusing on the world heritage sites and the key monuments concentrated on the Taj Mahal and the Red Fort. Much of the other physical and cultural heritage in their vicinity is uncared for. If you can see on this graph, we do see Taj Ganj and Sikandra, which are the neighborhoods of Taj Ganj houses, the Taj Mahal, and Taj, uh, Sikandra is the area where uh, the Akbar tomb is. So like the community around these, uh, around these heritage sites, it's only 34% and 31%, which actually they get direct benefits or get economic, uh, uh, are associated in terms of their livelihood with heritage-based tourism or associated services. And as a result of this, uh, Agra has become like a one day tourism destination. So then average stay is just like 0.8 day for, uh, for a domestic tourist. So that way the trickle down effect is not that much in terms of the economy uh, when we look at these numbers. And also like uh, one of the things uh, that I would want to mention about the city is that about 50% of the population is actually living in slums and low income settlements with about 168 slums uh, located within the west vicinity of these protect, uh, protected monuments. But the kind of slums that we have uh, in, the, in the city are very different as compared to the slums that exist in other cities or metropolitans. These are largely the historic core areas of the city. So they are so most of the people actually have housing tenures or land rights. What they largely lack and why have been they have been characterized as slum or poor living conditions is because of the lack of infrastructure. Like, like only 30 to 40 percent of the city is actually seaward. Similarly, the water situation in terms of the city, like 60 percent does not have house or water supply. So this is what the question is. And people who are living in uh, low income settlements, it's only about three to four percent who actually have livelihoods linked to heritage and tourism as two of facilitators are engaged in traditional class, but largely in the informal sector. Going on further, how can cultural heritage acts as a catalyst for development for urban poor? So 
cultural heritage can actually play a very significant and a critical role in sustainable development if it contributes to the economic, social, and environmental productivity of its people. So there is a need to reimagine heritage conservation so that it, uh, it can act as a tool for poverty reduction. And taking that further, we need to include the process of heritage conservation, look at upgrading the living environment of the people and also providing opportunities for livelihood through that process and conserve heritage, both tangible and intangible. So I would be uh, talking about the program, which is the Cross-Cutting Agra program. Uh, this is actually on the uh, along the riverfront of the city, which was Mughal riverfront, which had four water gardens lining the riverfront. Uh, so the idea of uh, the overall vision objective about this program uh, was to upgrade the living conditions of the slums and develop a livelihood opportunities as a pilot project which was supported by, uh, financially supported by USAID, and it was done in partnership with Agra Municipal Corporation, a non-for-profit organization, a development NGO, uh, CURE, actually implemented this project. The project was designed as an inclusive program to mobilize, organize, and empower urban poor communities to actively participate in the development of sustainable livelihood pathways, physical upgradation, the heritage, tourism economy in the city. So even though we, uh, if you look at these maps, we do see uh, the various condition of the various uh, protected gardens, which protected and non-protected gardens, which exist on the, uh, along the riverfront. And along with that, we also see the low income communities and slums, which weaves uh, or are actually part of the overall urban landscape. Uh, we did a pilot looking at uh, this area, which is Kachpura, Mehta, Bagh, uh, and uh, there were two lesser known monuments. I'll go further in, into it here. So this was uh, this is Tachpura, which is also a historic uh, uh, settlement, but being uh, a peri-urban, uh, uh, located at a peri-urban area, it's largely devoid of most of the city-wide infrastructure and services. And the, uh, this settlement also housed a protected uh, uh, mosque, Humayus Mosque, there is also uh, Gyara City, which is also like uh, a protected uh, monument. But these were like, when we started working in 2005, these were like really lesser known monuments, even Mehta Bagh at that point of time. It was just like 25,000 who, people who would visit Mehta Bagh uh, in a year. So these were like really lesser known, uh, lesser known heritage sites. So the idea was to use these lesser known heritage sites as a livelihood opportunity for the people who are living in Kachpura. So the uh, heritage community led heritage walk was developed linking these uh, lesser known heritage sites passing through the development. So the thing is how this small initiative of developing a heritage walk actually in, like supported in the development of, of the settlement in itself uh, both uh, economic development as well as physical development. So the uh, approach that was adopted in this community-led initiative focused on mobilizing the community of Kachpura, identifying their needs and priorities, participatory mapping, which is a very important tool of engaging with people. So it was not just mapping the cultural uh, aspects, but also the community aspects, uh, which the community connect and feel important about. Also, uh, social mapping, how the community uses various spaces, like uh, it helped us identify the panchayat shock and the significance of the people and the association of the people with that panchayat shock within, within the settlement. Then developing a heritage walk with the people, what should be the route uh, based on the various components that they would want to highlight. Mining stories, it was when we looked at developing a script and linking it with the walk, it was not just archival research that we focused on, but a lot on oral and local histories. How does people can connect to, to the, their heritage because they've been living there for, uh, for decades. And then core component was livelihood development. How would people run this walk? How would people manage this walk? So focusing on skilling and capacity building, enterprise development and building market linkages to make it sustainable for a long period of time. 
then also it brought in physical infrastructure, basic infrastructure, as well as conservation of heritage, and then building on partnerships and governments uh, uh, with government, with philanthropies and private sector. So these are largely the snapshots. So we worked with different groups, working with women, with youth, and uh, with elderly, because each has a very different need. So also adopting different tools, central mediums, we did participatory mapping, as I mentioned, uh, of cultural assets, uh, of the assets, uh, social mapping of areas. When we looked at the event of the walk, we actually did like a storytelling workshop spanned over a week, where we actually uh, mined various local and local histories and local stories directly from the people. Sahina, uh, in Sahina, the livelihood development. Yeah, yeah. So we did uh, develop like the enterprises and capacity building of the people. So the people were trained as tour animators, youth, uh, like girls were engaged in various other activities, and then a women livelihood group was. So it was looking both as building their capacities, also build supporting in the livelihood. These were the updating activities, building toilets, starting from one toilet to uh, household toilet to multiple household toilets with families because the sanitation conditions were really poor. The, uh, the pathway development, and also because it was not connected to citywide uh, sewerage network, so a decentralized wastewater treatment plant, which significantly improved the overall living environment. And then there were certain community initiatives that the community came up with developing a tea terrace on their thing, so the, when the tourists are coming, so they can actually step up on the terrace have a good view of the thing looking at economic investments there have been multiple investments that have been that have come through a small initiative by different partners looking at like even world bank under the pro poor tourism development the what's what set up by the water trust and there has been a lot of support by private sector there has been a significant increase in the tourist footfalls as i mentioned there were just 25 which came uh, into the and four and five and in 2015 it was about like five five times as business development as i mentioned about the uh, tea terrace and kiosk there were job creations and economic enhancement so overall uh, the living conditions also improve in terms of access to water solid waste management water supply and it directly impacts on these uh, direct sustainable goals no poverty gender equality clean water and sanitation definitely sustainable space and sustainable and inclusive space. So looking at the success uh, of this pilot model, it was scaled up to the city priority A, which was Tajgar, which had a much higher tourism potential and footfall, rich in cultural heritage. There were 22 slums and low-income settlements with 30,000 households. There was a large drain, which used to discharge about 16 MLD of gray water, just abutting the Taj. You would have all seen those pictures. So uh, in this case, uh, it was more about cure supported in the implementation of ground activities, but what was most important uh, or uh, uh, about the thing was how multiple projects were developed to leverage funds which can support in the overall development. So there was a Taj trapezium zone project which provided in situ upgradation of 15 slums like providing roads, drainage, community toilets, solid waste management. Then under the Rajiv Awas Yojana pilot project, we looked, uh, we included developing safe housing, retrofitting of traditional houses, re restoration and revival of wells on even heritage based tourism development works. And there was a plan which was made for Taji's train, which looked at controlling septage management of solid waste. So it was looking at a holistic development of an area, be adopting an area based approach with community kept central into the overall process. So way forward, especially when we look at sustainable development uh, thing is to a change in approach towards heritage conservation, moving from monument centric to people centric and people led change in the perception of investment in cultural heritage as an expense opposed to investment to stimulate development. So there needs to be an understanding that cultural heritage can act as an asset that can yield not just economic returns, but also cultivate social, cultural and human capital through provision of services and public goods. Multi stakeholder partnerships are a must because there can be a lot of convergence which can ensure sustainability of such large scale projects when we are looking at historic cities and increased investment in cultural heritage can actually to economic development and overall quality of life. Thank you.
Thank you very much, China, for presenting the journey of Agra as a heritage city and the struggle, and also the issues of convergence. A round of applause for Sahina, digital applause at least. Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, friends and colleagues, you see some exciting presentations from Agra, Gwalior, Kochi, and Ajmer Pushkar. I know 15 minutes is too little to present this entire journey of years. But nonetheless, we must compliment. This is a really great learning of uh, experiences from Indian cities. In the webinar one, we heard some very interesting experiences from Paramaribo, Bukhara, Jerokastra, and Galeta. And today we saw these four very, very exciting uh, presentations, initiatives in India, particularly from city of Gwalior, Kochi, and Agra. Thank you very much. A round of applause for all the speakers. And I know we have exceeded the time uh, that was allocated to this. My apology to the panelists for the next session. I now hand it over with a sincere apology to my colleague, uh, Professor Jigna Desai, to take the discussion forward. Over to you, Jigna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sashwat. As you said, uh, it is very difficult to present a lot of these activities in 15 minutes. And uh, so I can understand, but I think it is now lesser time for the discussion, which I think we'll try to make the best of it and possibly extend a little to get uh, the most valuable inputs from our, uh, uh, from our various panelists. Uh, it was also really heartening to hear words like uh, uh, biodiversity, climate change from presentations of Kochi, uh, sustainable development goals from uh, Gwalior and gender develop, uh, gender equity, gender equality, livelihood from, from the Agra presentation. It was really heartening to see all these different uh, discourses come together in the discourse of conservation. It's something that is much needed and much uh, in alignment with the question of historic urban landscape. Now, uh, without uh, getting into much of the summarization at this point, I will straight away go to our esteemed panelists. And uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. James Westcott. I'll invite him to give his comment, uh, comments and his feedback on uh, what he just heard. Uh, well, may I also request uh, uh, Neha or Yashraj to, to, yeah, he's already put his, uh, 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 Dr. Westcott's uh, uh, brief bio in the, uh, in, in the chat box. And as you can see, uh, he has worked in Agra. He has worked in Delhi and Lahore, especially related to waterworks. And I would really be keen on hearing his reflections on what was just presented. Uh, over to you, Dr. Westcott. Well, uh, thanks, Prash, for the work that was presented. Thank you very much, Dr. Westcott. That was some very uh, short, short, but of some very pointed arguments that you've made. And the, discussion of meaning of landscape is something that is a very important discussion that we need to have. I would also request all the uh, participants, if you have any questions, whether it is related to the presentations or related to the uh, panel discussions, please put them in the chat box. So uh, I'll be able to pick them up uh, at the end of all, uh, all uh, presentations by the panelists or discussions by the panelists. Um, we'll definitely come back to you, Dr. Westcott, with some uh, with some questions. Uh, if no one asks, I do have some. So, or, or at least I I love some more reflection on the subjects that you picked up. Uh, I'll go to Dr. Uh, Iris Gleichman. Uh, I invite her to give her uh, reflections and her inputs and possibly lessons. She's been uh, uh, she's been the director of uh, municipal development and rehabilitation of Old City of Lviv and. Uh, she's also been consulting uh, in many cities for local self-governance, including in the city of Kochi. So uh, over to you, Dr. Gleichman. Um, may I request, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Gleichman's bio is there in the chat box for everybody to refer. Over to you, Dr. Gleichman. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I will just briefly highlight an aspect uh, on the project that I worked on for a couple of years. Um, called uh, Municipal Development and Rehabilitation of the Old City of the Leaves. And it was an international cooperation project uh, between the German government and the Ukrainian government uh, for a couple of years. I was in charge for it. 
we weave being in Western Ukraine in Europe um, and being a city with about 700,000 inhabitants. Um, I, I come more from a kind of practical approach and want to highlight one aspect of uh, this project. And I have some problems here, sorry. With my, um, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, the, most of the city is a UNESCO area buffer zone which describes the challenge of the city, also the challenge of the city after a long time of being neglected and uh, missing funds and, and so on. Um, it's UNESCO heritage for a mix of traditional styles and uh, backgrounds, cultural, religious, and was a center of, historical center of political and commercial trade. Is, uh, it has monuments that are you know, outstanding and it has also the everyday architecture that is outstanding. So my point is that we focused in this project on the everyday architecture with an area-based approach and came in a way kind of bottom up. And I think the approach from Shaina, Khan and Agra goes in the same direction. And I think that is something that is key in addition to, you know, being concerned with the monuments, the, the special monuments involving people on, on their daily life or daily um, needs and supporting them. The setup was um, a co-financing uh, program between the citizens, the GIZ and the GIZ being the De German Development Cooperation, um, organization and the city of Lviv in various um, settings. Activating citizens, uh, we did uh, through some city workshop that annually took place with, you know, bringing restoration closer to the real life and uh, bring an understanding of your own building and your own surrounding um, that is part of the heritage um, so that people also started to understand that the investments, the, the small and little investments that they take for plastic windows, for example, that they don't put that into something that destroys their building, but something that actually keeps what is there. Um, so we, we started these co-finance programs on a very small scale training craftsmen, but also um, training people, so to speak, and understanding what um, their livelihood actually consists of. Uh, you can see um, on these pictures, small scale was building parts, doors, windows, gates, balconies, that were co-financed also on the basis of building up a neighborhood and building up a professionalization of um, each, each group involved. Um, so that in the end, uh, you would actually have, have an understanding of um, what, you know, what, what you have, what you own and value it. And because you share the costs as neighbors for one entrance door, for example, there are 40 different flats behind it you share some, some part of the costs, you suddenly value it more, you suddenly identify more with it. And I think that is something I, I can see would also possibly work in the context of um, India, of course, with, you know, as we saw and heard with completely different challenges, um, but uh, on the very low level, an approach that you can um, you know, understand as a citizen that has many needs and not necessarily the understanding of um, UNESCO heritage in their own life. So along with that, of course, um, is a whole setting that is uh, important that you have the strategies, the programs, but also an openness from the city administration to cooperate 
with citizens um, and the, the transparency about it um, so that there's an understanding that it's not something from the top, you know, we tell you, um, you live in some heritage, but uh, from the bottom as an identification, um, my life is this and I live with historical buildings or I live with heritage as my life and not as a tourist attraction or as an outside view. Um, I think this is um, probably for now, just to start with um, a comment, which I, I see as a huge potential in uh, different uh, cities, also not UNESCO heritage cities um, that have big heritage and um, have a huge potential to um, develop a livelihood that is um, yeah, good for people who live there, but also interesting for people to come and visit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gleichman. I think you brought out the, uh, the, the question of professionalization. And I think that would be something that if uh, uh, the cities that have presented here, we, we would come back to that discussion, maybe if we get time on how, how these initiatives that uh, initiatives of livelihood that uh, everyone is talking about in the Indian cities, how can it go to the next stage of professionalization? So I think that's, um, especially because in Indian context, the challenge is the informality of uh, such professions. Uh, that's, that's a specific challenge and would be worth discussing. Uh, I would uh, request uh, uh, Professor Minja Yang to give her comments here. She's had a long association with UNESCO Asia Pacific, and uh, she's for a long time, she's initiated many discussions of world heritage in India. I've met her a couple of times when I was younger, and I'm sure she doesn't remember me, but I would love to hear her view on, uh, uh, on especially the journey of, uh, of uh, heritage conservation in India. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for associating me uh, in this uh, Zoom meeting and for giving me the opportunity to at least see some of my old friends. It's been 12 years since I left uh, the UNESCO uh, New Delhi office. And during that time, some of you will recall how we focused a lot on local authority capacity building and uh, trying to get heritage cells and heritage units uh, um, established in, in different municipalities with very rich heritage. In fact, since almost all of India's heritage, uh, almost all of Indian cities have such rich heritage that it's, uh, it's really been a challenge. But I'm also uh, like really impressed by some of the case studies I've heard today and that I've been reading about recently in India. And I think uh, it's really going uh, in a very positive uh, direction. But at the same time, let's not forget that India has always been a country of pilot projects. I mean, there's just been so many pilot projects in India. But the problem is that these pilot projects never get scaled up into overall policy. And so, I mean, we have this kind of the deja vu uh, sort of feeling that whatever we, you know, whatever new exciting projects come up, we're immediately worried of, uh, of its sustainability, what happens after the project funding ends, and who's going to carry it over. And, uh, and I've been, um, although it's been 12 years that I've left uh, the post in India, I still go there. I mean, prior to COVID, I used to still go at least once a year. And now I'm involved in a couple of urban conservation projects in India through a Zoom tutoring. And um, so, but before I, uh, so I don't really want to comment on the, the, the projects that have been presented because I think they're all excellent, excellent, very well qualified conservation architect planners. And I think there's, um, uh, from, from that point of view, India doesn't really lack expertise. It's a question of how to get the local authorities uh, trained. It's really a question of governance, basically. You know? And many of you have mentioned that. But one thing that's super, very positive is that uh, now people are not just looking at monuments as such, but looking at um, uh, conservation areas and also about the social dimension of it. So everybody, all the speakers today have, have mentioned about poverty alleviation and upgrading of uh, slums, uh, you know, uh, urban um, uh, equipment, especially water, uh, drainage, etc. cetera. But um, at the same time, uh, I'm a bit worried about these guidelines thing because HAL, not to forget, HAL is an approach. It's an approach. 
there is absolutely no one size fits all guideline that can be applied to all these different cities because because um, because every city uh, even within India uh, have very specific characteristics. So you cannot have this hull approach. It's a urban historic urban and landscape approach as. Other speakers have said it's talking about the layers, but it's also the layer is not just about layer of the past, but it's about how to add new layers. So I've had uh, quite a lot of arguments with some of my European um, uh, conservation colleagues because they look at uh, integrity very much in, in, in from the perspective of visual integrity. You know, of course, if you can have visual in integrity, so much the better. But if you come from a country like Japan or Korea, you know, where my origins are, it's so dense that you cannot possibly have a new building that doesn't somehow, um, you know, show up behind a historic uh, tomb site in an urban area. So, so of course, I don't think, I mean, uh, UNESCO and ECOMOS, um, you know, I think it has to contextualize um, it's this HAL approach depending on the realities of the of the of the terrain of the field and uh, so when there is visual integrity possible great but at the same time i think it's um, the hull approaches above all to influence uh, the urban planning tool urban and territorial planning tool so i think there's no need for uh, expertise in for uh, monumental conservation i mean i have seen through my own eyes, that despite the limited resources, I, I you know, um, ASI uh, um, conservation architects have been doing really good work. You know, on in 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 a country like India with so many monuments, it's really the planning and the governance issue. So I, I um, was a bit disappointed to uh, to 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 learn from my recent involvement in in India, in ongoing involvement in India that um, the inventory is still very much based on monuments and uh, uh, heritage buildings. So it, it's this whole approach of an urban conservation area, apart from a few cities, is still not in the legislation. So even for world heritage uh, inscribed cities from India, the, the, the concept of um, not even the concept, I mean, urban conservation areas is just not legislated. I mean, it's in a sort of town and planning, town and country planning act, where it can be in a, in, um, can be mentioned, but in terms of an area protection, you have to do the inventory, a detailed inventory of all these areas from streetscape to individual buildings, and especially non-listed buildings, because, in all my work in, in World Heritage um, cities uh, all around the world, the problem doesn't come from listed buildings. The problem comes from non-listed buildings. These, these little shacks that are next to, or modest dwellings that are historic dwellings that are next to the monuments or within the immediate proximity of the buildings that the problem begins. You know, if those of you who've been following the World Heritage um, Committee sessions, I mean, I, I, uh, I went about two years ago of, for a reactive monitoring mission to historic Cairo. But the problem has been going on for like over 10 years, it's been 15 years that the same thing has been said over and over again, but nothing is gonna change until the legislation changes. So although they, uh, in, in a country like Egypt, they have increased the number of uh, buildings that are listed, just like the inter intact uh, work in India, you know, intact keeps making, you know, great inventories, but there's, in the majority of cases, these intact uh, uh, listed buildings are not uh, protected legally. So that still remains a big problem, you know. And then, and especially, what do you, how, how about all the, uh, the context of these listed buildings? You know, not, not just historic monuments of grand architectural uh, masterpieces, but even modest um, heritage buildings. It's the context that's important. So I think that the HAL approach is, um, it's, as I said, it's, it's, it depends very much on the characteristic of each city and each town or each segment of uh, settlements. So a detailed inventory is really necessary. I mean, also through this uh, new technology that all of you use already of uh, landscape um, recording, 
And uh, another thing I really wanted to say that it uh, really, uh, the HAL approach requires, or even urban conservation generally requires not just looking at the core area. You know, people were looking at monuments, then they were looking at the monuments and surrounding area, but the, but the whole point of HAL is to look at it in a, in a, in a, in a holistic manner. So this means that you not only have to plan on the core area, but the immediate surrounding urban area and the greater territory. Because if you want to avoid certain kinds of equipment that's necessary for a modern functional city, you've got to put it somewhere. So where do you put it? I noticed that in a lot of Indian cities, um, the core area is of course, you know, quite dilapidated and now things are picking up. And I understand things are getting better. But in the immediate town extension area, the, the so-called modern city, it's still pretty low rise. It's like two or three stories, but that can be much more densified, especially if you look at the new urban uh, agenda of UN Habitat or uh, the, 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 um, the uh, SDGs, the, the 2030 SDGs, you know, it's to build a city within a city and to increase the density. So I think without uh, destroying, the cultural landscape and the natural context of a lot of Indian cities, you can still densify outside of the core area. And then in the great area, you know, one of the most hallucinating things about when I first uh, came to discover India about what more than 25 years ago is that how towns just kind of crop up in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in the rice field, you know? It's a question of the decision making process of where the new city or town extension happens. I mean, you know, it's, that's, that's very political, you know, it's the decision-making process. So I think that there needs to be a much um, more vigorous approach towards uh, the governance of uh, urban development, urban extensions, especially in view of the energy requirement and the climate issues. So um, again, I don't want to be too long, but in looking at the integrity, one of the key things is not only look at the visual integrity, great if you can do it, but really important is a functional integrity. A city cannot be a city if it doesn't have um, inhabitants, if it doesn't have commerce, if it doesn't have a work, uh, work and residence. I mean, you have to look at a city from its functional point of view. And there are always compromises necessary. You know, if you follow some of the World Heritage debates, there's a hue and cry over demolitions of certain parts of a historic area, but this has been happening. You know, it depends on where you want to decide to demolish. It's a decision that you decide, okay, in, in Paris, I live in the Marais, uh, just uh, down the street, there's a huge area that was totally demolished in the 1960s. And it was been, it's been rebuilt. It's, it's the uh, Saint Paul, um, you know, uh, area. And, and they have built it in scale. And that it, started, it was built as a social housing complex you know, with the galleries and uh, commerces on, in the, on the ground floor. So mixed use, uh, mixed function, mixed use, and uh, mixing of um, social um, classes or, you know, social groups, co communities within a city is, I think, very important and extremely pertinent to the 2030 SDG goals. I the, one of the uh, ways that urban conservation has been successful in Europe is that it's not a cultural project. Urban conservation in Europe, whether it's Italy or France or Spain or Germany, they all started out as uh, urban renewal projects of, uh, you know, uh, rehabilitation of um, of uh, uh, of uh, housing, you know, <laughs> increasing the housing yeah. supplies and all that. So anyway, I don't want to get uh, more more into this. So uh, uh, let's keep the discussion going, and I'm really happy that. Uh, a lot of things are happening in India is, is and as uh, uh, Professor Westcott said that over the last 10 years, things have really been happening in India. So let's just hope that these excellent pilot projects and the money being invested into these projects are gonna be upscaled into uh, national, state and municipal policies. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think the challenge is to mainstream that discussion rather than making them just examples. So I think, uh, thank you very much for that, that mirror and many of the projects that uh, we saw while they're talking about a lot of things that documentation of heritage assets is still with reference to buildings. So thank you, that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, we have questions for you, but we'll take all the, the questions at the end of the 
uh, discussion. I uh, move on and request uh, Professor Dongwei to uh, give his comments uh, on, uh, on the basis of his deep experience in China on uh, urban conservation as well as architectural conservation and what are the lessons that he would uh, talk about for these examples that we just visited in, uh, from India. Now over to you, Professor. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this uh, very important uh, uh, international uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and I feel I learned much from uh, these two days uh, uh, program, uh, especially uh, uh, as we uh, uh, discussed just, just now. I think uh, these uh, uh, UR uh, is a very important uh, uh, tools for the uh, urban development, especially for the uh, historical uh, cities development. I think uh, uh, why it's uh, uh, so important, I think uh, we can uh, learn from UN's uh, urban development report. According to this uh, report of UN, uh, we learned uh, in the coming 30 years, the whole urbanization in the world uh, will be uh, focused in Asia. More than 85% of the world organization is focused in Asia. Uh, that means in the coming 30 years, uh, many Asian cities, including historical cities, will have dramatic changes. Uh, so uh, we pay attention to uh, HUR. It's not just for now. Uh, but for the future. Uh, uh, I, as I remember, in the past 40 years, uh, China's reform changed China's urban structure totally. Uh, about uh, 7,000 million population moving from cities, uh, from countryside to the cities, and changed China's cities. Uh, greatly. And uh, so I believe in the coming 30 years or more, uh, Asia urban, uh, uh, urban development will change the Asian countries uh, totally. So that's uh, uh, why we should pay attention to uh, HUN uh, from now on. Uh, from the uh, very beautiful cities just now, uh, today. Uh, we have a very good uh, tour, culture tour. Uh, we look at so many important heritage cities in India. And uh, if we think about the, the, the common years, the urbanization, uh, we should think about how could it, it could be changed. So I think uh, we should use HUR as an important uh, cultural resource to make uh, conservation and uh, also make the urban development for the, uh, for the coming years. It could be, uh, have some uh, important uh, uh, contribution for those uh, beautiful uh, cities. And also uh, another point is uh, uh, capacity building. Uh, as uh, uh, Minja just mentioned. I think uh, it's uh, not just for the urban planning design or heritage conservation, but most importantly for urban management in many aspects. Uh, so uh, we should uh, upgrading the, uh, the level of uh, uh, capacity building. That's why the uh, UNESCO uh, running so many training programs every year focused on this point. And we, uh, luckily, we also uh, in, in joined some, some of them. And uh, also another one is we should have uh, uh, integrated policy making. Uh, that means, uh, for instance, uh, today we, uh, we, uh, we have some uh, city cases from India. They are from different parts uh, of India. But uh, if we have a way to integrate them 
uh, together in some way. It may be uh, good for the uh, regional or even the whole country's development and also uh, the heritage conservation. I can give you an a, a example uh, from China, what we are doing now in these years. We uh, use the uh, Great River Basin as the uh, geographic unit to link different uh, historic cities together, uh, such as uh, the historic cities along the Yellow River or uh, Yangtze River, for instance. Uh, in the past seven years, we are running uh, seminars in different uh, cities in, uh, along the Great River Basins. So uh, uh, now we can have a general strategy to make heritage conservation in a regional level, but not uh, one city by one city. No. Uh, by this way, we can understand in deeps the uh, Asian culture, how it changed in a, in a uh, region level, uh, how the uh, different uh, historic cities, they are linked together uh, in the past. So uh, by this way, we have a, a, a kind of a national level uh, strategy, uh, integrated different uh, uh, historic cities together. I think uh, uh, this is a, a important tool for uh, countries, especially for big countries like India, uh, because uh, as, as uh, Minja just said, almost all Indian cities are historic cities, a uh, uh, very important uh, heritage for us. So uh, if we can have a national or regional strategy, uh, for instance, along with uh, big or smaller rivers, we can have uh, many, many uh, hist historical cities groups. So uh, we can have uh, uh, integrated policy for those different uh, historical city groups. Uh, these are kind of uh, top level uh, policy uh, for the heritage man man management. Then uh, in the urban level, we can have a more detailed uh, policy uh, for the heritage conservation and urban development, especially uh, for uh, countries like India and China with so many population. We should think about how uh, the urbanization will be in the coming 30, 40 years. Uh, that means there are have uh, many, many people moving from countryside into the cities, especially historic cities, because many of the historic, historic cities, they are still the regional uh, social and economic centers in different parts of the, of, uh, of, of, of the country. So uh, we should integrate the conservation policy and the urban development policy together as a whole. That's, I think, uh, maybe we can have a, a contribution to the uh, HUR Thanks. Uh, development for the coming years. Uh, that's my uh, learned from uh, uh, different reports in, in, the, uh, in today and uh, two days ago, uh, so many important and uh, educated uh, reports. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rongwai. I think your, your uh, observation about uh, your rapid urbanization of India and China, and I think Sashwath has pointed out over here that uh, China's urbanization rate has been of 41% compared to India of 29%, but they're still the most populated uh, countries. And I think the question of uh, urbanization or uh, people come from the rural areas coming to historic cities is also a very important point because in Indian context, what we have seen is that historic cities still not only continue to be the social centers, they're also the places where one can find affordable housing compared to the newer parts. So that ways also they attract uh, migrant population. 
And I think your point about uh, thinking of historic cities as, 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 as in relation to each other, as a collective, as, I think that's a fantastic point because historically they were related. I think that is, uh, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back with questions uh, when there are any. Um, I'll now request uh, Susan Fayad from Ballarat, Australia, a very different context from India. However, I think uh, her point of view would be very important because uh, uh, the Ballarat has successfully implemented the HUL approach and she's also the member of the global HUL program. So if she could talk about uh, some lessons from Ballarat that can be relevant for India, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you so much. And, and thank you, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I come from the perspective of the international hull work that I do, but also I work in a local government. So I'm on the ground. Um, so, and I think uh, local governments have been mentioned a few times that um, needing to get the hull approach, like scaling it up and bringing it into the local government setting is important. Um, I just wanted to congratulate the speakers firstly, because um, I've kind of, I'm so excited to, to hear, uh, even though it's midnight here, I'm very excited to hear um, what uh, what is happening and, and the, the way people are thinking. I think the first important step with the Hull is to change your mindset, the way that you think about cities and the way that you think about heritage and the way that you think about communities and people. And I see some... Um, huge changes from uh, uh, you know discussions that I've had when we first started working with Hull in Ballarat in Australia it was uh, 2012 it was six months after the Hull recommendation was ratified by the UNESCO General Conference and one of the first uh, meetings I went to for UNESCO was a World Heritage City Mayor's Conference in Nanjing I think it was about 2014 and the, there were discussions from the mayor and local government people from AGRA actually there. Um, and so I, I understand this idea of the monument centric approach because that was very much what was being spoken about then and looking into the monument rather than looking out to the city and how the city functioned was was very much the way things were done. The other thing that I remember in 2013, some of the early hull pilots that were being done in India um, by the World Bank, there were three Indian cities that the World Bank was working with to implement hull. Um, and what I'm seeing has changed and, and the big shift is that you've actually got local people now implementing this and trying to work with that, which is very different to what was happening when it was people like myself coming in and doing the work for you. And I think that local ownership is really important as well. Um, what I was hearing from the speakers, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we've done in Ballarat, but what I was hearing from the speakers was a lot of fantastic um, whole tools that have been developed. So things like community engagement tools, ways of working with communities, um, tools for, uh, you know, implementing the hull. And I think that's probably the one thing that I've noticed that is missing from the hull toolkit is implementation tools. Like how do we actually implement it in our organisations or what are the, the models of the projects or how we can run hull projects in our cities? Um, and I think that this um, these tools are really powerful, even though we're in different cities and different places all around the world. Um, I think having toolkits where people can see uh, what worked in a certain city or what um, could work in theirs is really useful, particularly for people in local governments um, who are really busy, who <laughs> might not have the skill set to know how to implement these things. Having tools that are developed are really, um, really important. Um, we've got a toolkit for Ballarat up on our website, which is Hull Ballarat. Um, what is it? Sorry, hullballarat.org.au. Um, and there's a toolkit there that shows a lot of the things that we've worked on. And one of our tools called Ballarat Imagine, which is a community engagement tool of how to, um, in some ways it's a cultural mapping tool, but it's about understanding the, the values of what people and communities value about their city um, is uh, has been used all around the world now in different places. So that these some of these tools are adaptable and really useful. So when you talk about a guidebook, and I helped co-write the, the guidebook that Witchrat put out um, many years ago, the whole guidebook, um, it's, it's helpful to see case studies, but I actually think there's more power in a toolkit. So that's one suggestion for you. Um, in terms of uh, local government, I think there was some conversation by some of my fellow panellists about 
the challenges with getting local governments and others involved in Hull. Um, what I might do is just share a, share my screen and just show you a slide from uh, some work that we did when we first initially, um, I'll just make sure this is up, sorry. Uh, some work yes. that we did when we tried to, yep, thank you. Uh, to look at what were some of the challenges we had in implementing Hull in our organisation. And um, this is what some of our offices look like. We've got so much work and so many things coming to us that it we're very time poor and we're very reactive. We're reacting to development proposals as they come in. We, we don't have a lot of time to think big and think strategic and think about sustainable development, which we should be doing. Um, we also have politicians who are changing regularly. I remember the, um, the Agra mayor, I, I, it was some crazy number of councillors and mayors that were working in that local government. I couldn't believe how big they were. And I thought, how do you navigate the politics in those organisations? They'd be so difficult. So that idea of governance is, is very difficult to do. Um, some of the practitioners uh, don't want to change. They don't want to do things differently, sometimes because they don't have the skill set all the tools to help them change. Um, and we also find that our community can be over consulted. So we, we're going and talking to them a lot. And so they can be a lot of consultation fatigue. So, and some of our communities as what you've found probably in your slum areas that were being mentioned in one of the presentation uh, are quite disempowered. Um, they don't have a voice. So going and talking to them, they probably don't understand how to engage or don't feel empowered to do that. So there's a lot of challenges that you need to look at in organisations. Um, so just to quickly talk about how we did this in Ballarat with thinking about those challenges, we actually brought our local government people together. We brought people from all around the world and we, we got community, businesses, developers, all into conferences and workshops and sort of just talked about how could Hull be applied across our city? Now, in Ballarat, we didn't do it just as an individual project. We actually did it across our entire city and, and the area beyond the city, the territory beyond it. And now I'm actually implementing this across a 40,000 square kilometre area with 13 local governments. So we're taking it even bigger now. Um, but we, we, we had to work and co-design how does Hull work in our city. Then we realised there were a lot of skill development that needed to happen. So we did research partnerships and capacity building. And then we stepped off and started talking to our local communities. So I won't go into the, the detail too much, but um, uh, it, it sort of was this way of um, helping the organisation change and start to understand how to function differently and knowing what was needed from the organisation before we could actually step in and start to do some of that um, planning, integrated planning work that's required by the Hull. Um, and at each stage we've gone and we've co-designed how do we do these processes with the community. Um, and today um, the Heritage and Hull, we've really worked out what works for our city. So things like um, heritage is really embedded in our creative city strategies. It's embedded in our prosperity frameworks now. Um, we've got, uh, you know, local projects happening on the ground where it's really prioritised. But what's really prioritised is that participatory work with communities and, and integrated interdisciplinary work with lots of different stakeholders coming together. So that really big participatory planning that happens at the beginning. And we've got all sorts of people talking about the values of the city and how important it is, um, which never used to happen before. So I might just leave it there. Do you know, I'm conscious that we're, um, yeah, we're running out of time. So, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, 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 while I think there are, we, we have run, uh, I mean, we have we are around almost 20 minutes over the time. So I'm there are some questions here that they've also been answered, uh, but I'll just kind of, if, if any of the panelists want to reflect upon some of the things that are being talked about. So for example, what was being talked about is the, is the, is the meaning of landscape in, in an Indian context. Uh, and also in the later, in the earlier presentations and the later discussions that Minja pointed out, or, or even 
Dr. Dong Wai pointed out, we were talking about social hierarchies. We were talking about how landscape is possibly a political tool and also divided in terms of accessibilities and social hierarchies. And if any of the uh, any of the presenters want to talk about that or uh, reflect upon that, maybe from Agra uh, or uh, or from Kochi or from uh, Kualia, I welcome them to. Uh, and uh, the, the other discussions that were that were going on were, were about activating citizens that uh, that uh, Dr. Gleckman talked about. Uh, then uh, Minja talked uh, talked about, of course, the importance of local governance. So did Susan. Uh, so Dong Wai talked about the relationships, and actually, what is also coming up across is the HUL approach that talks about relationships, that talks about uh, monuments, uh, as, as Susan pointed out, looking at out, looking outside, looking at its relationships in city, looking at its relationships, and I think all that becomes very important. One thing that I'm very hopeful about, uh, from the point of view, of, one is what Susan said. I, it was very hopeful that. Uh, even Ballarat started with a monument centric approach and it seems in possibly a decade gone to a different direction. So possibly that there's the hope. But the other thing that I'm hopeful about is this webinar itself. The last uh, fourth webinar uh, is about, uh, is talking to the local, uh, local urban local bodies. We already have uh, urban local bodies being represented today. Um, and uh, in the fourth seminar, we are going to talk to the local uh, urban local bodies, possibly coming out with the recommendations, and possibly in one of the one of the things that in that is called, that we would be talking about is how expertise need to be embedded within the urban local bodies for uh, urban conservation to be mainstreamed into the planning and development tools. So uh, I would uh, request uh, uh, maybe. Uh, one of the speakers, maybe Nishant or, or Dr. Rajan. If I have, I think others have already left. If you, if you want to reflect upon some of these uh, and views of the panelists, so we could do that, or we could uh, conclude now. Uh, Dr. Rajan, Nishant, if there's anything you want to say, I don't see uh, yes, Jayati uh, or Shahina here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she had to leave uh, Professor Desai. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. This is really a huge learning. And uh, uh, as a practitioner, to be honest, uh, it's a reality check. So uh, clearly very humbling experience. So I think there's a lot to do. And uh, as much as we try, um, it's never enough as well uh, when we are collecting data, when we are trying to address issues. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's very true that we are trying to find uh, still the meaning of landscape in our context. And um, when we start talking to urban authorities and we say cultural landscape and we say historic urban landscape, it's uh, uh, the reactions we get from them is uh, it's, it's very interesting because we still haven't been able to define it. And uh, we have not, never presented it uh, the landscape as an idea, as an approach has never been presented. So I do agree that we are trying to uh, go scholarly. We are really proceeding very quickly in this uh, area and we need to uh, probably make terminology of some sorts to be able to uh, address that uh, gap uh, with the practitioners and the urban local bodies. And um, uh, the last thing also, I think, uh, I think uh, what is very interesting is that now we also from the urban local bodies, we get a lot of reactions about livelihood and uh, uh, and emancipation of minorities and uh, gender issues are brought up and i think that is uh, that is something we still would like to even push in further in hul in terms of well-being of uh, i mean secular well-being of all the citizens that's that's it thank you thank you very much everyone and most of the people here are my mentors and teachers actually so it's a delight thanks a lot for having me Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajan. Any any thoughts on uh, this? Yeah, I think like uh, uh, I, I think I should uh, speak from the uh, point of view of uh, urban local governments in India, and I think like uh, heritage is uh, uh, both national and cultural. It's not at uh, the priority of the local governments because they are on a firefighting mode like uh, they have everyday issues that they go to really face like road waste or whatever like so we go to really kind of equip 
we got to give more power so this whole thing about 73rd and 74th amendment is uh, very relevant over here you got to unless you give more power to the local governments and local governments are more sensitive towards your historical landscape or your mon monument or whatever your uh, both national and cultural heritage and i think you go to come out, kind of emancipate them you go to empower them in order to kind of spend their time money effort and energy and uh, i would tell you this case from kochi there was this particular uh, councillor who fought for the heritage of that area and a very popular man very learned person but he lost in the ensuing election because he fought for for heritage and uh, and heritage wasn't uh, the concern of the articulate section of the society they were more of uh, more interested in the 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 development in courts part and uh, they thought this man is uh, was an infringement towards a better living sort of a thing so we need uh, a positive discourse we got to take that discourse to the people unless we kind of in our kind of a democracy a functioning democracy unless you uh, uh, people fight for their heritage both natural and uh, cultural i think all these discourse among uh, the elite the experts the elite the, the 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 other section of the society would make not much of a difference that's what my take on this on working thank on thank you ground. thank you dr rajan uh, uh, professor munjai you have something to say no i just wanted to uh, say that um, one of the intriguing things is that um, you know this separation between state subject and union subjects. Mm -hmm. And although I am completely in favor uh, of decentralization, and as uh, Mr. Rajan just mentioned, the local authorities and the local population are probably much more sensitive, you know, about the value of their, uh, of, of what they possess in terms of natural and cultural assets. It's just that the vast majority uh, of, uh, of uh, some of the smaller cities, they just don't have the means. They don't have the financial means to do things, nor do they have the technical, you know, capacity at the local authority level. So even if some, if a, if a, a responsibility is decentralized, I think that there still needs to be a system in which the center, like a core of like heritage uh, architect and planners at the central level, union level, can go out and give support to the local authorities. You know, because uh, some cities are just so important to the identity of India that it shouldn't just be left to the local authorities to decide what they can do or what buildings to 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 you know uh, to build or not to build. Or so I think that there, there needs to. I don't know if it's possible to have that kind of a reform, but somehow to redivide or re re reconsider the state subject uh, and and the union subject, especially with regard to rivers. You know, some people were saying, oh yeah, Adonwe was saying earlier about uh, taking a river as a sort of like a, 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 a development strategy to take a look at improving historic cities around certain stretches of rivers or along over a river. So, I mean, how can a river be just be a state subject? It cannot be. I mean, it affects, you know, all the upstream, downstream. So I think, I don't know if, if such things are possible, but I think it would be good if uh, groups got together in India to actually reflect on the actual division of responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hope I would really love to go on and on because this is a very exciting discussion. Uh, but I, I will just end on a, once again, a hopeful note. Though, uh, though personally, if I met any of you, we, uh, the, the discussion would be different. But I think as a collective, we need to end on a hopeful note. Uh, then I think 12, 15 years ago, when I started my career in conservation, uh, the discussions that we were having about conservation uh, did not involve uh, this kind of range of discourse that we are talking about today. So I think that is the note that I would want to end on. And I think uh, that's uh, from, from there and the representation of the local governance that we now have, we would not have imagined 10 years ago. So I think that's the note that I would like to end on. And I really hope to see all of you uh, on um, 16th, where we are going to have some more presentations uh, to look at uh, historic urban landscape beyond the world heritage sites and beyond and um, looking at smaller cities, smaller initiatives, and how this approach can help uh, cities that are not necessarily, uh, that, that have local regional presence, how it can help them and, uh, and 
some more exciting discussion at that time. Uh, I would end with thanking everybody who's here. Uh, thank you very much for a very, very uh, interesting, insightful, and wonderful discourse that we had. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you.